Hello everyone and welcome back to the JMZ Online YouTube channel. Today we're getting back to work on the Ford Model A and we have multiple different machining operations ahead of us. As you may remember from the previous video, the split valve guide design of this engine presents some difficulties for us in regards to machining our valve seats, but we found a solution. Before we get into that, there are two manifold studs that still need to be removed from the block for one of our first machining operations. These studs could very well be original and they're heavily corroded. We don't want to break the studs, so we're going to take a multi-tiered approach, starting with soaking them overnight with Croil, who as you may know, are a sponsor of our channel. Since I'm also planning on using some heat to help extract the studs, I opted to try out Croil with graphite, as it performs well in high temperature conditions. We can also get to the backside of the casting through the water jacket opening, so we'll be heating the backside of the bolt hole as well. In addition to the coil and heat, we're also going to use the air hammer to help shock the stud, further breaking up any corrosion. We can hammer against the end of the stud, as well as against the backside of the casting, being sure not to go too excessive to avoid any further damage. With a stud removal tool on the ratchet, we can attempt to unscrew the stud. I did not think that was going to happen. I have to admit, I had already researched replacement studs and had them in my shopping cart because I was pretty worried that these were not going to come out without breaking up. Nice. I'm pretty happy those came out. So if you guys watched the video from a couple of weeks ago, the big concern on this thing was being able to machine the valve seats easily due to the fact that from the factory, they have a two piece valve guide. It just has everything fitting kind of loose by today's standards. So we got a lot of different comments on that video about what we could do. And we actually got the modern valve train kit for this from a company called Antique Engine Rebuilding. So this setup actually has a valve guide that is one piece and it actually presses into the bore in the block. And then it has, you know, your more traditional valve with a retainer and two keepers. We'll just brush out the bores real quick. As always, we're installing the guides with some press fit lubricant on the bore as well as the guide, starting them in straight and driving them the rest of the way in with the air handle. About like that's perfect. So there's what it looks like from the top. And from the side the bottom. I can drive the other three in here until they just touch that. Same thing on the other side. And that way we can get them all at the same height on the bottom. I installed the guide so that the top side in the port looks pretty much how the factory guide looked and then the bottom side protrudes through a little bit farther than the factory guide. With the valve stems measured and a bore gauge set, we found that the guides had plenty of clearance as installed. So I am just barely gonna touch it with the hone, pretty much just like a couple strokes there to make sure that we have any high spots taken down. It's not uncommon for the end of the guide to be slightly deformed after installation, so I opted to quickly give each guide a few strokes with the valve guide hone, just to make sure that any of those tight spots were opened up and to verify that my valve guide pilot fit well for our valve seat machining on the Surty later on. Before moving on to cutting the counter bores for our valve seats, I decided to go ahead and get the block set up on our RMC 1000 boring and surfacing mill in order to surface the valve cover and manifold surface of the block. Basically, I wanna do the manifold surface there and the valve cover surface, but I also need to do this surface here since it's on the same plane, but I have to miss this larger part here that sticks up. So I've adjusted the cover on our cutter so that it's up out of the way. We're gonna start with a half thousandths cut here. To get the entire surface cut in one pass, I had to wait until the table had fed past the raised casting and then move the y-axis of the table as it was traversing in order to get the cutter past the edge of the surface. After the first cut there, the corrosion became a bit more obvious and I was glad that I took the time to set it up and get this side resurfaced. So considering this is as bad as it is, we're going to go in 5,000th cut increments. To 
taking it to 10 thousandths total. It's much more like it. I think a finish cut, half thou finish cut, low down the feed, would be good to go. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that everyone will agree that that looks significantly better. All right. So I found a seat that is about the right ID. It's about one and three eighths on the ID. The OD, I've got a one six twenty five. That's kind of as big as we need to be to hit our valve, but we're not going excessive. And we're also only going seven thirty seconds deep just to avoid any risk of hitting water on this thing. I'm gonna go off of this seat here. I already checked and the head is level here on the machine and I'm gonna set my depth and I'm gonna cut them all to the same exact depth. I'm probably actually gonna leave them maybe five thousandths high and then we're gonna take it back over to the surfacer and we're gonna deck the block. So with the right size counter bore cutter for our seats, I basically touched down right here on the deck, basically zeroed the readout here on the spindle. And I'm gonna raise up five thousandths. And then we'll go up here and we'll set our stop. So here's what that looks like. And this is just down tight. And it's just a kind of a positive stop for the machine. So we're about five thousandths up, meaning when I'm done, the seat is gonna actually be about five thousandths high. And then we'll deck it over in the other machine. And I did go through and kind of poke around all the edges to make sure that we weren't through into water, and we weren't. These are gonna look kind of nasty on the top just from the rust, but you know, you do what you can with what you got. <laughs> Since I did leave the seat sitting a few thou proud of the surface, the next step in the process is to deck the block. So I took a thousandths off and we touched all the way across on this side. Well, except for there, which obviously is kind of deteriorated. We touched all the way across here. We did not touch all the way across here, but we did touch just a little bit, just skimmed it out over here. So let's keep going. There was pretty significant corrosion around the water jackets, and it actually took 15 thousandths off the deck for us to be confident that the gasket would seal. With the block decked, it was time to move back over to the Surti valve seat machine and set up our cutter to cut the valve seats. In this case, we're going to use a three angle cutting insert with a 45 degree seating surface that is 60 thousandths of an inch wide. When it's all said and done, the finished seat will mostly consist of nearly no bottom angle, the full width 45 degree seat angle, and just a sliver of the top angle. After cutting the first seat, I blued the valve to get a visual of where the valve seat was contacting the valve face. At that point, I actually opted to adjust the cutter to push the seat out to a bit larger diameter and seat the valve a bit further out on the valve face.
You can see that at this point, we've pushed the seat out a bit further on the valve face, but we're still not clear to the outer edge, which is generally good. Finally, the last check I did before moving on was to do a quick vacuum check on the valve, which checked out well considering the clearance in the valve guide with no lube or valve sim seal. We always check as we go because it's much easier to fix a poorly machined seat now than it would be later on. At this point, we're cutting the seats completely off of a visual. As we cut, we watch as the bottom angle comes in, followed by the seat angle, and when we just see a sliver of the top angle come in, we know that we have our full seat width and need to stop cutting to keep our valves at all the same height. We always prefer to grind the valves on our machine, even if they are brand new, to give us the confidence that there will be no issues moving forward. After grinding all of the valve faces, I installed the camshaft with the lifter in order to check that there was enough adjustment in the lifters for our customer to set the valve lash later on. While there technically was enough, we made the decision to grind 20 thousandths off of the tip of the valves to give a bit wider range for a buffer. I know that this is not like a perfect surface here, but I'm just kind of showing roughly how much we're taking off of these valves. So here's a valve that we haven't ground the tip yet. And you can see it's at about 20 thousandths there on the gauge, plus or minus, you know, a couple thou. And here's one that we have ground the tip off of. And when I put that one under the indicator here, oops, you can see we're at about zero there on the indicator. The tips of the valves are easily shortened on our valve grinding machine. After removing 20 thousandths, most of the chamfer will be gone, so we also went ahead and reground the chamfer on the tip of the valves as well. Our original plan when this block came into the shop was to simply touch up the cylinders in the hone, keeping the bores at the current oversize of 80 thousandths. As such, I got the block mounted into the cylinder hone and gave each cylinder about five strokes. Unfortunately, the cylinder hone quickly revealed just how warped, out of round, and corroded each of the cylinders was. After a quick phone call to the customer, we decided that it would be wise to take the cylinders to the next oversize, meaning that we actually need to remove 20,000 spore material from the current size. So our nominal standard bore is 3.875. Currently, it's 3.955, which is 80 over. We're gonna go to 100 over, which puts us at 3.975 inches. Normally, if we were going to go more than about 10 thousandths oversize, we would want to set the block up in the boring machine to bore all of the cylinders to within three to five thousandths of finished size before moving into the home. However, at this point, the block is already oily and mounted in the hone, so we're simply going to put the coarse diamond stones into the hone head and rough hone it out here as opposed to boring the block. Coarse diamonds are great for removing material quickly, but the finish that they leave on the cylinder walls is extremely rough and not ideal for piston ring sealing. At this point, we have the block within a few thousandths of our finished bore size, so we're going to switch over to a stone that leaves a nicer finish, although this stone is still fairly coarse as well. Now that they're roughed in, we'll switch over to our finished stone. For our final step in the honing process, we're using an even finer stone, which after about five to 10 strokes of the hone is going to leave us with our final surface finish for this engine. I won't say that this engine wouldn't have run if we had simply left it at 80 thousandths oversize, but by going to the next oversize, I can be completely confident that my customer won't have any issues. With the machine work wrapped up on the engine block, the last step of machining that we needed to perform for our customer was on the cylinder head. Flathead designs can be a bit complicated to get fixtured on our machine, but I was able to get two bolts down through the spark plug holes to rigidly fixture the head, along with a standoff to support the side that was hanging over. It took a little bit of work, but I was able to get it dialed in and rigid in order to mill the surface. 
So it touched across here, all the way across this side basically. We've got little skims here and here and here and here. Touched all the way across over here and it touched this corner over here. So you can see it's just pretty wonky. We're gonna keep going. After several cuts, the surface finally cleaned up with about 10 thousandths total taken off. You guys always hear me say it, and here I'm going to say it again. The last step in the process, and arguably one of the most important, is the final cleaning of the components. The block was ran through our spray cabinet before being fully rinsed and blown completely dry in order to get any and all debris out of any of the critical areas. The block looks incredibly different than when it first came into our shop, but before we send it home, we decided to go ahead and assemble the valve train. Now for you old timers who have done the hundred of these, or maybe even more, give me a break because this was the first Model A that I've ever assembled, so I did struggle a bit. I looped up the valve stems and installed the valves, which arguably made the next step of installing the valve springs more difficult, and I should have done it in a different order. Once I had all of the valve springs pushed into place, I came back and got the valve spring retainers slipped in underneath the springs. I then used my grandpa's old flathead valve spring compressor to compress the springs in order to install the valve keepers, which I did with the aid of some assembly grease to help hold them in place as I released the springs. That was everything but fun, getting those installed. The lifters have to be able to raise enough to install the camshaft pass to them, so at this point we use some of my old Legos to hold the valves open to give the lifters enough room. I don't think we usually look like hacks on the YouTube channel, but this might be the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, put that as part of your video. I know it looks kind of goofy, and if I was going to do these every single day, I would probably design a tool to do this, but in this case it worked. The customer is going back with their stock camshaft. Before installation of the cam, we lubricated all of the lifters with driven assembly grease and installed them into their bores. We then lubricated all of the cam lobes and journals of the camshaft to help with break-in before installing the cam into the cam bore. Once the cam was fully installed, we were able to again open the valves using the valve spring compressor and remove the Legos which had acted as wedges to keep the valves open. And with that, our work on the Ford Model A is complete. To recap, we have somewhat modernized the valve train with the modern valve kit from Antique Engine Rebuilding, we've resurfaced the manifold and head gasket surfaces of the block as well as the head, and we've honed the block for the next oversized pistons. All in all, we're extremely happy with how it turned out, and we hope that you will like, subscribe, and stay tuned for the next video. Thanks for watching.